When we were in Taiwan back in March, we stumbled across a shop in Guanhua, the digital plaza there, that had all kinds of thermal interfaces. Half of the store was dedicated to fans of all sizes, all the way down to 10 millimeters. And the other half was dedicated to cool, purpose-built PCBs and thermal pastes and pads. We bought our fan power board that we've been using for testing there, and it's been the best 280 new Taiwan dollars we've ever spent, or about $9.50 US. We also bought this, the T68 30 by 30 thermal pad for 30 NTD. It's about a dollar US. Technically, it's, it's a dollar and two cents. So sorry for the one dollar thermal pad clickbait because it's uh, two cents extra. But we're testing it today against the IC's diamond graphite thermal pad, which is a, about a $10 solution for a similar size, and against thermal grizzly carbonate, which is about $13 for the same size, and thermal paste. And we're doing all of this on our heavily controlled thermal test vehicles that we engineered recently. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic Cooling and its Liquid Freezer 2 line. Arctic is actively restocking its Liquid Freezer 2 coolers that rank among the top performers for CPU coolers right now, including on Ryzen CPUs. The Liquid Freezer 2 series is focused on high thermal performance and value, featuring a blackout design and including a VRM fan mounted on top of the pump block to help provide airflow over neighboring VRM heat sinks. Arctic has also started selling its P12 120 case fans. Learn more at the links in the description below. We bought a bunch of other cool thermal related products there as well, it's just stuff related to cooling. And some of those included some thicker versions of this pad that we're looking at today, which came in this packaging, and that was all there was to it, which is part of the $1 cost too. It's not a sheet of cardboard and a clamshell and all the branding that you get with IC and their graphite thermal pad, but it still does the job. And that's what we're looking at today. Now the thicker one will be interesting. We also have uh, the full Panasonic sheet, which is actually the supplier for what IC for Innovation Cooling's graphite thermal pads. And one thing we're not sure about is which supplier this came from. We don't know if it's Panasonic. It, it doesn't really seem like it. And uh, it doesn't have any branding on it. So this thing, we, we were unable to identify what the product actually is called. We're going with T68 just because that's what it says on the packaging, at least in, in letters and numbers. The rest of them just say 30 by 30 by 0 0.025 for the sizing, and that'd be the thickness at the end. And then we've also got uh, what appears to be a serial number, but that returns nothing when you search it in Google. We also looked into the characters on it. The Chinese characters don't reveal anything either, so uh, we'll get a close-up of the packaging. But it just, as far as we can tell, it just says Yi Bao Zhuang, which is just like one per package or one bag. Uh, it says Shou Jia, which is the price, so 30. That's what that number is, not the millimeters numbers, though. That's at the top. It also has the name of the shop on it, which we're happy to shout out. You should definitely check it out if you're ever in Taipei or you live there, it's on one of the top two floors of Guanhua Digital Plaza, and the shop is called Mi Ya Dian Zi Pu. So uh, they're in the, one of the top floors. Highly recommended though, go check them out. Uh, so yeah, from what we can tell, there's no branding as to what the product is on the package. Maybe the shop cuts it from some supplier and, and packages it, we don't know. So anyway, this makes it hard to identify. What we do know is a couple of other things about the thermal pad market. First of all, Panasonic is a major supplier and they supply IC's pad. Uh, th there's the PGS solutions out there. You can look those up on DigiKey if you're interested. There are several types of graphite pads by Panasonic. They vary primarily in thickness and then Innovation Cooling rebrand these into its IC Diamond Graphite Thermal Pads that you've seen on the market for a while now. And uh, those numbers are tweaked a little bit. So the thermal conductivity can get tweaked from brand to brand because it's technically measured in different ways. So you can make the number into different things. The uh, differences otherwise are mostly the gamer branding that I see has stuck on their pads. Now, Thermal Grizzly's Carbonaut solution is different still than both of these. Significantly, it's basically a cloth and we have some scanning electron microscope photos from last time when we reviewed the Carbonaut pad from Johannes Venner, who did the photography for those. And uh, we'll show those again, but they're different significantly between IC Diamond and Carbonaut. This one that we bought for a dollar is different still. It's not as different, but the surface texture feels different. The IC one is grittier. It's hard to explain through a camera, obviously, but it's a little bit grittier. Uh, it has a, a different texture profile to it when you look at it. And 
that's about all we know. We don't have a thermal conductivity number. We're going to assume, based on the testing we've performed, that the $1 sheet we bought is lower. So we're going to run with that for this content. And otherwise, uh, all we know is the size of it. So uh, before we get into some of the testing, we want to talk about thermal conductivity a little bit. For thermal conductivity, there's a lot of different numbers out there for it. You'll see different pads claiming things like 1,900 watts per meter Kelvin, for example, or 37 watts per meter Kelvin, 20 watts per meter Kelvin for a lot of the Panasonic stuff. And within a brand, normally you can compare those numbers. Intra-brand, that's okay. But once you start comparing like a, a thermal pad to a thermal paste, or better, more appropriate still would be one thermal paste to the next, it becomes kind of misleading because the companies can do the testing different ways, just like you can for fan CFM, and produce a different number. Now, if everything's tested the same way, that's fine, but it's not. And so it's not fair to talk about like this pace 12 watts per meter Kelvin and this pad 20 watts per meter Kelvin, ergo pad is better. That's not really how it works. There's a lot more to it. You want the thinnest interface possible, but you still have to make contact. And that's a potential weak point for the pads we're reviewing today because they can't really conform in quite the same way that thermal paste can. And the uh, minimum thickness on thermal paste is always going to be lower than the minimum thickness on these pads at least. So that's going to help them a lot, the paste a lot in testing. Uh, we've already reviewed a couple of pads. We have a lot of testing notes in those videos, but we're using our dummy heater setup. We'll show some footage of it. And this is a carefully engineered solution that is highly precise. It produces almost the same exact numbers every single time, and it's more precise than a real world test bench would be. So it's good for thermal interface testing. Let's get into it. We'll start with full torque testing and then look at performance against an unflat cold plate on the A500, and then we'll look at lower torque settings. We'll go from 95 watts up to 270 watts here. Remember that the delta T over ambient value will obviously increase as the heat load increases, but also the delta between the pads and paste will increase as the heat load increases. We'll start with 95 watts. This is similar to stock performance on most R5 or R7 CPUs and the pre-10 series Intel CPUs. The thermal paste sets our baseline at 6.4 degrees Celsius over ambient, with Carbonaut about 1 degree warmer and IC Diamond's graphite thermal pad a bit warmer than that. The $1 thermal pad that we bought in Taiwan runs 8.51 degrees, so it's about 2.2 degrees over a good thermal paste. That's actually really good performance for this kind of heat load. Considering anyone on enough of a budget to want a $1 reusable graphite pad is probably not running heavy overclocks, we'd be fine with using this on a refurbished system or a budget class computer. It's not great, but if it requires this type of setup that we have to find a repeatable and precise two degree difference, then we'd say it's probably good enough for most use cases. But most specifically, that'd be the lower power refurbs that just need some life breathed into them. Here's the 150 watt chart. We're keeping the scale the same so that it's easy to visualize the change in bar length. This would be similar power consumption to an R9 3900X and about 20 watts over the i9 10900K with MCE disabled and within the tau limit. In this test, the $1 pad is starting to lose more ground. It's now 3.6 degrees warmer than the baseline paste, 2.4 degrees warmer than Carbonaut, and 1.4 degrees warmer than the IC Diamond Graphite Pad. Here's the gap growing again. 200 watts is about what the 3950X runs when it has a simple all-core overclock. Although obviously the die layout is different on Ryzen, the hierarchical scaling should be about the same for different compounds. The Intel i9-10900K when boosting under tau will hit about 200 watts when run at reasonable auto voltages on better boards, so that's about where we're looking. In this one, the $1 pad is now 4.9 degrees Celsius warmer than Hydronaut, which is 12.56 degrees warmer than ambient as baseline. The paste is pulling away from the thermal pads at this point, where we see a wider gap between Carbonaut and the paste than any one pad to the next. IC Diamond is 3.3 degrees warmer than Hydronaut, while the $1 pad is 1.6 degrees warmer than the IC Diamond Graphite Thermal Pad. That's awfully close to the $10 solution that we previously tested, considering how low this one costs. 30 NTD is pretty damn good for this. Here's the last one before we go to the A500 air cooler with its imperfect plate. 270 watts up now with the CLC360 has us uh, comparable in power consumption to the 10900K when boosting for 56 seconds under tau with poor auto voltage configurations. That'd also be similar to a manual overclock with a higher end cooler. At this heat load, paste is now 5.5 degrees cooler than a $1 pad. We're clearly seeing the scaling that benefits paste as the heat load increases here. The $1 pad is about 1.7 degrees warmer than the Innovation Cooling Diamond Graphite Pad, 
with a 3 degree warmer temperature than Carbonat. The 5.5 degree gap against paste is significant and would be equivalent to the gap created from a good cooler to one step down. So paste remains the preference for higher heat load transfer efficiency, but our $1 pad for its cost did admirably overall. We're impressed for the price to performance. Before we get into the Corsair A500 results, we need to share two important pieces of information. First of all, here's a photo of how the IC Diamond Graphite Thermal Pad looked after use of the A500. Despite being reusable, the knife-like non-flat heat pipes did a number on the IC Diamond Pad when mounted under the A500. The Carbonaut pad also eventually got torn up from the solution. Secondly, here's a chart of the surface flatness from a recent review. The reason we're using the A500 here, as we've said before, is because Corsair, as shown in this chart, has inadvertently made an excellent tool for testing imperfections in cold plates as they correspond to the change in thermal interface. We would normally have to pay a machine shop a lot to get a tool like this made but Corsair sells it on the market for anyone to use. This unflat surface can change the stack a little bit because now we have two key points to consider. One is the thickness of the pad, which will matter a lot in areas where contact is poor, and the other is the true reusability of the pad. Here's the 95 watt A500 chart. In this one, the $1 pad and IC Diamond have now become functionally the same. The unsmooth Corsair plate is benefiting the $1 pad that we bought, which survived the mount better than the IC Diamond pad that got sliced by the cooler. We don't have a tool with the precision to really gauge the thickness here. It's tough to get a read with calipers, and we tried feeler gauges, but the two appear to be roughly the same thickness. If you have suggestions on tools that we can add to the arsenal to get this level of precision next time, please post them below so we can pick them up. The calipers are a tough read because the thermal pads don't have a sticky side like traditional thermal pads do, and they sort of float upward. They appear to both be 0.025 millimeters thick. Although we've seen some people online say the IC Diamond Pad is 0.0125 millimeters thick. It comes from Panasonic ultimately and they make a few different sizes, so we're not 100% sure because IC Diamond doesn't specify it on their product sheet. Either way, if it is the smaller of the numbers, then maybe that could explain some of the performance gap we're seeing. We think it's more about how the IC Diamond Pad handled the knife-like mounting though. Either way, the difference is negligible, and the IC Diamond and $1 pads are basically the same. They're both about one degree worse than the paste or the Carbonaut solutions. At 150 watts, the $1 pad pulls ahead more, now at 17.81 degrees Celsius over ambient, or about one degree warmer than the Carbonaut pad, and about two degrees warmer than paste. IC Diamond is 18.38 here. At this point, the trend is maintaining and clear. The $1 pad has worse conductivity, but it seems to have better contact with this particular cold plate. Up to a point, that'll benefit it, but not forever. At 200 watts, we see it's one degree cooler than the IC pad, or 2.6 degrees warmer than paste. Finally, it flips back the other way. At 270 watts, the $1 pad starts to tip and runs about one degree warmer than the IC solution. We validated these numbers a few times on each pad and it was repeatable. The poorer conductivity of the cheap pad is now worth more in weight for performance than its better contact with this particular cold plate. The paste runs about 5.7 degrees cooler. Next up is Torx settings, tested with the EVGA CLC360 again. As soon as we started loosening the screws, things dipped south for the $1 pad. Reducing torque to 0.45 newton meters had temperature climbing to 22.9 degrees over ambient, or about 5.4 degrees over the paste. That's consistent so far with the earlier results. At 0.24 newton meters, the $1 pad went to 23 degrees, then 29 degrees at 0.15 newton meters, which is now five degrees warmer than the IC diamond pad and 10 degrees warmer than the thermal paste. At a ridiculously low screw torque of 0.011 newton meters, which is so low that you could nearly breathe on the screw to loosen it, we're at 46 degrees on the $1 pad. That's 14 degrees over the IC Diamond Pad and about 25 degrees over the paste, which fared best of all in this test due to the nature of a paste that squishes around as needed rather than a pad which obviously can't relocate itself if there's a gap bigger somewhere else. You'll never use this torque in a computer, so all this does is help illustrate that mounting pressure matters a lot for these quote-unquote reusable thermal pads. But this may be more relevant in applications where mounting pressure is low. That's not in desktop computers, but they're certainly out there. And if you're trying to use this somewhere else outside of the DIY PC space, it's something to consider. Concluding then, at a dollar, it's... So to recap the IC stuff, 
we basically ended the IC Diamond thermal pad review by saying, look, this thing's not friggin' magic. It's not like as great as everyone thought it was when it was reviewed a few years ago uh, on mass by people. And it's, uh, it's fine, but we would still default to thermal paste. That was our conclusion. We said we'd go with thermal paste. One of the reasons is it's objectively better, and that's the main reason. Now that said, as we've stated, twice now. There are a lot of good reasons to buy the thermal pads. It's just you shouldn't be buying it because you think it's going to be better performance, because it's not. It's not how it works. But they could be useful for things like uh, refurb shops where you're just trying to swap stuff and get something running quickly, do some troubleshooting. You could throw a pad on there, boot it, make sure it works within reason. You're not doing like severe thermal stressing or overclocking with it, so a pad is fine for that just to make sure the system works and not have to deal with paste all the time. You could buy it for uh, throwing into a system that you're building or buying for someone who's never going to maintain it. It's going to be in deployment for 10 years. You're working with a small business or something and they don't really need much other than a web browser. Maybe you throw one of these in there and then it's hands off, no maintenance needed uh, other than when they inevitably infect it with viruses. <laughs> so that's another good use case for the thermal pads. And coming back around then from the general conclusions with these pads as a whole and back to this one, if you can find it, it's awesome. Uh, it's not the best. We'd still default to thermal paste. You likely have it coming with coolers if you're buying aftermarket. Even stock ones often include paste pre-applied. So you might as well just use it in that case. But we don't know how this thing ages. Presumably it would be about the same as the other two solutions because it's a solid object. But uh, we're not really sure. We don't, we don't know if it's going to age as well. It's a little bit more durable than the IC pad, which might be a bad thing thermal in some ways, but certainly favored it in the reusable marketing angle that both these take, or all three if you include Carbonaut, which is a little, which is certainly less reusable than the other two. But for the $1 pad, if you can find it, grab it. Uh, it's great for just quick troubleshooting testing. Seems to work fine. It's a dollar. There's no packaging associated with it. So we're, we're really impressed with how it performed. Uh, and definitely gonna grab some more next time we go back to Taiwan whenever we're able to again because we'd like to take some home for, uh, for future use for testing when we're just assembling things for a short period of time and then taking it apart the same day if it's not something thermally sensitive. So pretty cool. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can catch the other reviews of this type of stuff in the links in the description below. Or you can go to store.cameraznexus.net to support us directly by buying things like our mod mats, our mouse pads, and our shirts. Or you can go to patreon.com slash cameraznexus for behind the scenes videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.